There it goes. All right, so uh, you've just pushed that change into GitHub, and pretty low-level change, but you wrote your unit tests, and you got that covered. And you're pretty sure that it got covered in the software simulation test, too. And now here you are. You've got about uh, 100 tons of rocket fuel and a $100 million payload on top of it, and they're about to light the candle. Are you really sure you got that code right? This is the kind of thing that uh, David over here and I, who work really close to the hardware, we're kept up at night about the difficulty is to get absolutely every bit right when it comes down to uh, testing. So this is going to be a really short talk, kind of an after-lunch palate cleanser, um, about uh, something we're doing on the LibUAV CAN project, which is a C++ implementation of UAV CAN. And um, it's going to be about um, how we are uh, building a hardware test pipeline for this project. Um, as I said, my name is Scott Dixon. Um, I, I've been working on, with uh, Pavel on the UAV CAN specification V1. Um, we are going to have a talk on that later this afternoon. And um, I have been uh, writing the V1 version of um, the C++ implementation of that protocol. So first, the why. Why do I care so much about hardware testing other than wanting to go to sleep at night? Um, here's a quote from the Aerospace Corporation, a paper they put out that I really like. The system should never experience uh, expected operations, environments, stresses, or their combinations for the first time during a mission. <clears throat> and this is a kind of a, a typical um, a system, way we look at a system and, and testing. You've got system of systems, and the system, and the element, and the subsystem, subassembly, and, and part. And for me, what I'm considering uh, is LibUV can here, because it's a library, um, I'm actually treating as a part. And as a part, um, what's underneath me are the drivers, and then the, the peripherals of those drivers are on, and then, of course, the hardware that those peripherals are connected to. And then above me are the, the subsystems that are, are using my part. So the why is because I'm delivering a part, and in that um, uh, previous slide where you looked at, there's a, a, a width of testing that's expected. When you buy a part from a manufacturer, um, especially anything that's a certified part, you expect this to be a rigorous, rigorously tested thing that adheres to the specifications that it advertises. This is why you're paying for it. And this is kind of the philosophy um, that we have as we're developing LibUAV can. Um, another reason that we do it is um, the whole Swiss cheese analogy, which I, uh, I put in this slide before I realized I was going to be in Switzerland, so it's actually kind of funny. Um, but, uh, so we're, we're, I'm going to show you some hardware testing, and it's going to be, you're going to be a little dubious. You're going to see, well, what's, what's typical hardware? You're a library. You don't know what your hardware is. Um, you're right. But um, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for holes in the cheese. So I, I don't know if everybody's heard of this analogy, but in a system, you've got your Swiss cheese analogy of failures. And as long as the holes don't line up, the failure won't escape out to a critical place where it can have real-world effects. So uh, what I'm doing is I am um, giving myself um, a, a kind of typical environment, hardware environment, to test on, and I'm looking for holes that line up through my library. And when I see those holes, I can plug them, and I can make my cheese less holy and less... Um, less obvious to, to be the thing that, that ends up lining up. Um, and this is the mantra that aerospace has had forever. I mean, I think everybody's heard, test like you fly. And uh, the uh, NASA and um, Boeing and, and all the, the big aerospace people really live by this. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, right here we see a rocket test. This is um, a $20 million rocket, I think, this test would cost, something like that. I'm not, not exactly sure. Um, we're an open source project. We can't afford $20 million tests. So what can we afford? Um, actually, it's quite impressive. So I work in industry, and I have started um, working with uh, the UAV CAN project. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed is um, it's a lot of fun. You guys have a lot of really cool tools. And one of the things that I don't have to worry about is confidentiality. It's open. And confidentiality is actually hard. Uh, it takes a lot of resources to maintain confidentiality. So there's a freedom and um, a, a fun and a utility in open source that is actually really powerful. Um, and so I had a lot of fun exploring that space. One of the first things that came across here is uh, a service called BuildKite. Is anybody familiar with BuildKite? Hands in the room, anybody? No. Pavel is, yeah, okay. Wow, not many. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an Australian company, and they have um, this CI pipeline, and I know what you're thinking, yet another CI pipeline. Um, but it's really unique. They've got this thing factored out in, a, in, a, in a, a, a really nice way where it's not just a monolithic offering. It's not like Travis where 
you have to use Travis's services and Travis's APIs and Travis's everything, which is great, it's easy. Um, it's not like Jenkins where you have to pull it down and host it and build everything yourself. It's right in between. They, they um, host all the stuff that, uh, well, at least I don't care about, but most people who are working on robotics and drones don't care about all the, the mundane machinery of managing your services and your servers and certificates and authentication. Um, but they let you bring your hardware to the pipeline, and this makes it great for firmware. <clears throat> so what we, uh, what we did is got some Raspberry Pis, because they're super cheap. Um, got some dev kits, which aren't very cheap. Um, Ian from NXP, I have to talk to you about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, then we have um, uh, Build Kite out there. And so what the, the, the flow is, is that we've got our Docker containers, and, and that's another thing that's nice. We have the Docker containers so that, um, yes, we're using Build Kite, but we're not tied to them. I could just as easily toss my Docker container on Travis CI and great, they go out of business or something. Um, I have my Docker containers running an EC2 host um, that I spin up and I put into the, the build kite queue. Uh, pulls our LibUAV can source from GitHub, runs it through their automation, um, builds it, and I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the build parts. Um, but the last thing it does is once it's built these hex files, build kite sends these hex files down to my Raspberry Pi in my garage. Now, the Raspberry Pi in my garage gets those files, and it's got a little J-Link, and it's got a J-Link EDU Mini on it. These are great. They're $20 for a full J-Link, as long as it's not a commercial application. Um, and it um, J-Links it over to the EVB. It's got a, a, a UART over there, and it runs the, the tests right on an actual Cortex-M target, and one I, one I care about, somewhat representative hardware. Um, I've got a little bit, uh, um, I'm a Canadian here, and one of my favorite desserts, Nanamo bars. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Uh, we've got a little Python framework we call Nanamo that, that uh, takes this and monitors the output of the UART and coordinates it, and then ultimately reports back success failure to the pipeline. Um, so let's tell you how much it's cost us. GitHub, free. Docker Hub, free. Uh, BuildKite, free for open source. Um, EC2 does have free tiers. Turns out that it's not quite beefy enough to do builds, but um, uh, it, it, it can be how much you want to pay for it. I'm paying maybe $10 a month for the demo I'm showing you. Um, you can pay hundreds of dollars a month if you really want to have a super blazing fast build times and hundreds of people. Um, Raspberry Pi is $40 each, $25 for that Sager, and then a dev kit anywhere between you know, $20, $200, depending on what you're looking at. So all told, um, you're talking about uh, less than $200, uh, I'm sorry, this is all U.S. dollars, uh, 200 U.S. dollars um, for one node in your, your um, test farm. $20 million, so a little bit cheaper, so totally feasible. Okay, and now I'm going to do a live demo because that's always a great idea. Um, <coughs> Pavel, I have got an update to that pull request that I, uh, we were working on. I can get my cursor over here. I just got a mirror. There we go. Um, get push. Uh, 32. Oops. As, oh, upstream. Yes, live demo. What did I tell you? This is great. OK, so I'm not going to do the live demo, but I will show you the live pipelines, um, which is probably just as good. Where did my, uh, oh, Mac. OK. So this right here is what's in my garage. Um, you'll see the uh, Raspberry Pis uh, connected to the NXP dev kits, uh, the 148Ks. Um, I even got a little IoT out of band monitor so I can do a reset for my phone if I need to. Um, the, um, pipeline, here we go. So we'll go over to build kite. And uh, this is what you would have seen. Um, you would have seen uh, these uh, three builds get kicked off all in EC2 hosts in parallel. So we're running on a GCC compiler uh, x86, Clang compiler x86, and then we're cross-compiling for um, ARM v7M uh, in parallel. This is actually really blazing fast because it's parallel, so less than a minute. Yes? Oh, yeah, sorry. And it is... There we go. Um, <laughs> okay, so this, these guys all uh, uh, are one step they have to complete, and this uh, margin blocks on it. These guys produce hex files and JLink scripts. Those hex files and JLink scripts, um, I'll show you here, is the output from there. Then they go to the on-target testing, and this is where they're delivered to my Raspberry Pi. So what we're doing is 
Um, to start, what we're doing to start, uh, this is certainly not test as you fly, but it's a, it's a start. Uh, we're just taking all of our Google tests and cross-compiling that for ARM. And by putting a, a little bit of a system shim in there, um, we're able to actually run tests that we're using for on-target testing and getting credit for test coverage on those, and then just rerun it again on a, on a typical target. And you can see here, this is coming over the UART from that 148. And go back to this. So, um, right. Um, if you're interested in how to build Google Test for no system, uh, so that you can do something similar, whether run it on um, UART or SWO is a lot, is a lot better, actually. Um, I, I've got uh, that um, in the slides, and there's, it's just part of the, the LibUAVCAM project. So what's the roadmap? We actually want to do some typical testing. So um, I've got, uh, we're going to have a, a CanFD hat we're going to put onto the Raspberry Pi and create an actual physical CAM bus between the uh, Raspberry Pi and our dev kits. And then we're going to start actually doing CAN interactions between socket CAN on, on Linux and the ARM peripherals running on bare metal. And we can, with the, the bare metal firmware, we can actually do really tight timings now. We can actually make assertions within microseconds on, on some, uh, if we have an instrument hooked up that's accurate enough, and uh, do a test that says you can't violate these timing constraints. The other thing that's really interesting about this, um, uh, roadmap, yeah, non-Google test, because Google test is, like I said, just a hack to, to get started, but it actually uses a ton of heap. I had to actually upgrade to the 148 dev kit from the one that um, I had before, because I needed 116K of heap to run it. So we don't really want to be using that. Um, I definitely going to switch to SWO, which is really cool. In the Cortex-M module, there's a, a debug module that allows you to output character data without actually affecting the runtime very much. Uh, and I don't need to use a UART peripheral. So it's a, a really lightweight way to get um, actually much higher speed uh, output than a UART's capable of. And, that, and uh, ETM uh, debugging, uh, David, I think this is your JTrace, so we're going to use that as well in order to capture this and um, put on coveralls actually what instructions were run and up to as we rolled up into the code on target, so we get on target coverage. And that can be important for some regulators. There are, are some DL178 processes that say you must get credit for on target testing, and uh, we're going to have that capability. And um, I also want to put a resource constrained target in there. I want to make sure that we're not blowing through a bunch of memory. And so I'm probably going to have an M0 on there at some point, make sure we're running on that core. And I, I talked about performance testing. Um, I'd really love to have a, a PixHawk or, or um, NutX at some level in, into this build, build pipeline. Um, so similar with the Google test, I've got a link for how to enable SWO. It's really funny that. Um, you can't actually find ARM documentation in one place. It's all peppered around, but JLink has gone through and put it in their manual because of that, which is good. Um, and you can too. So this is an interesting idea. Whoops, how do I go back here? Darn it. Um, this actually is totally distributed. It's in my garage in Seattle right now. Um, it could conceivably be that if I wanted to work with somebody and they had a servo or some UAV cam part, and they were really concerned about what's going on upstream, I can give them a token that is their token, and they can get a Pi and put their thing onto the Pi, and all that they get is the binaries. They don't have any special access because of that token. And so now when I push something into LibUAV, LibUAV can, it can be delivered anywhere in the world to a person and say, here's the binaries that we're, we're proposing that um, come out of the merge that we're proposing. And they can run their own tests. And then they can, if we decide to, um, be given the, the ability to say, fail. No, this is going to break my hardware. We need to talk about this change. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. It could be a disaster. <laughs> but uh, it's something that I, I'm curious about and I might want to experiment with. <laughs> right. Um, I did um, actually put this whole talk together as a blog post first, and then uh, Ginger asked me to do this as a, as a presentation, so uh, uh, the link in the slide to the actual original blog post is up there. And we're going to keep that blog post updated as we do get uh, evolve this and uh, make it more mature. So, questions? All right. No questions? Yeah, uh, 
the question was, what are you using in the Raspberry Pi to monitor the serial connection? Right. Um, it's a little bit of Python uh, that I have on a library in my GitHub account um, called Nanaimo, um, which is uh, just a, a mnemonic for dessert. Um, it, it, right now, all it's doing is um, it's, it's taking Pi serial, and it's taking um, uh, it, it, it's wrapping some JLink commander commands in Python, um, and it's coordinating those. That's going to evolve over time. And that's going to become um, more robust. Um, it's going to start knowing stuff about SWO. It's going to have some parsers built into it. That's kind of where I'm going to assemble my toolkit for this. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. So is that screen scraping the results and then you bust a couple of times on the year? Is that what you're doing? Um, screen scraping the results? Screen scraping. Can you, Scott, can yeah. you repeat the question, yeah. please? Yeah. Uh, in our tool, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. So, I mean, it, right now it does actually parse out pass fail. So the build does fail if Google test fails. Um, but I didn't want to invest a lot in the Google test output parser because it's not structured and ultimately I don't want to be using Google tests. But at some point we'll come up with a, a syntax where we, you can say pass fail and you can also say here's some diagnostic information that comes from the SWO that then gets uploaded as an artifact. So if, if we do have that manufacturer scenario, we should be able to control what we can dump and put back up into our artifact repository and build kite to diagnose what the problem was. I, I think there's a, a big synergy here because Daniel has been working on Schema Supreme Connector mm -hmm. with, um, with the big pie. Um, that original picture and the opening of, of all the boxes and cubbies. Yes, yes. That was in his garage. Yes, exactly. Yes, we... Uh, I just want to capture what David said on, yep. on the microphone. He says that there's a lot of synergy here happening, and that we think we can maybe work together to uh, advance our future build rack that we have already that Lorenz presented this morning as well. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott.